Q1. WCO Private Limited is a joint venture of WCO GmbH and MSO Limited. WCO GmbH is a company based out of Germany and is also listed in Germany. WCO GmbH prepares its financial statements as per IFRS. MSO Limited is a company based out of India and is also in India. MSO Limited prepares its financial statements as per accounting standard. For the purpose of reporting of financial information to WCO GmbH and MSO Limited for consolidation purposes, WCO Private Limited uses reporting package, which comprises of balance sheet, profit and loss and other notes to accounts. WCO Private Limited prepares its financial statements as per Indian accounting standard. WCO Private Limited has taken useful life of some fixed assets in its Indian accounting standard financial statements based on their useful lives which is different from the useful lives of similar nature fixed assets taken by WCO GmbH in line with their accounting policies. The reporting package of WCO Private Limited is audited before reporting to WCO GmbH. The auditor audits the reporting package which is prepared in line with the group accounting policies of WCO GmbH and mentions in his report that the reporting package has been prepared as per the group accounting policies of WCO GmbH. WCO Private Limited makes an adjustment for changes in useful lives in the reporting package on the basis of group accounting policies of WCO GmbH. The auditor has asked the management to take same useful lives of fixed assets in the reporting package which have also been taken by them in its Indian Accounting Standard Financial Statements. Management has not agreed with the view of the auditor. Please suggest the right course of action. Position taken by the management is correct. Position suggested by the auditor is correct and if the management does not agree then auditor may have to modify his report on the basis of materiality. The matter relates to an estimate, i.e. useful life which may be subject to changes under different GAPs and hence auditor should ignore this point. The report would be for special purpose which should always be a clean report. Answer. Option. A. Position taken by the management is correct. RTP May 2019 Question number 6. DCHI Limited is in the business of optics and imaging products. It is a wholly owned subsidiary of Japanese company, DCHJ Limited. DCHI Limited has many expatriates, experts, working in the company whose tenure range from 2 to 5 years. During the course of audit of financial statements of the company, the statutory auditors observed that the company has not been deducting and depositing the TDS, tax deducted at source, on salaries of experts. The auditors assist that the impact of this can be significant as the company has many experts and salary amount is significant. Management explained that tedious on s salary of experts would lead to unnecessary hassles to the experts and they serve the company only for a short period. How should the auditors of DCHI Limited deal with this matter? Considering this as a statutory non-compliance, the auditor should look at the significance of the matter and accordingly should report the same in Caro. Considering this as a statutory non-compliance, the auditor should look at the significance of the matter and accordingly should consider reporting this in the main report along with CARO. 
The auditor should agree to the management's view as the experts are temporary workers and this may not be convenient for the management. Since the matter relates to statutory liability only, the reporting requirements do not arise till the time this becomes disputed. Answer. Option B. Considering this as a statutory non-compliance, the auditor should look at the significance of the matter and accordingly should consider reporting this in the main report along with CARO. Special Note Section 143 Power and Duties of Auditor Section 143 3. I whether the company has adequate internal financial controls system in place and the operating effectiveness of such controls. However, the reporting requirement on internal financial control is not applicable to a private limited company which is an one-person company, small company or company having turnover less than 50 crore as per latest audited balance sheet and and having aggregate borrowing from bank, financial institution or any body corporate at any point of time during the financial year less than 25 crore. RTP May 19th Question number 8 ABC Private Limited had turnover of 39 crores as at 31st March 2018. The company had taken a loan of 39 crores from various banks and financial institutions during the year ended. These loans were paid by the company before 31st. ABC Private Limited had turnover of 39 crores as at 31st March 2018. The company had taken a loan of 39 crores from various banks and financial institutions during the year ended. These loans were paid by the company before 31st March 2018. The company is of the view that the auditors reporting on adequacy and operating effectiveness of internal financial controls IFC, under Section 143-3-I of the Companies Act 2013 would not be required. The auditors of the company have a different view. What should be correct option? The turnover of ABC Private Limited is below required threshold and hence IFC will not be applicable. The turnover of ABC Private Limited is below required threshold and loan amount was fully paid before year end i.e. 31st March 2018. Hence IFC will not be applicable. The turnover of ABC Private Limited is below required threshold but loan amount was above required threshold. Irrespective of the fact that loan was outstanding as at 31st March 2018 or not, IFC would be applicable. In the given case because of the repayment of the loan before year end i.e. 31st March 2018, applicability of IFC becomes optional. Answer. Option C. The turnover of ABC Private Limited is below required threshold but loan amount was above required threshold. Irrespective of the fact that loan was outstanding as at 31st March 2018 or not, IFC would be applicable. MTP March 2019 Question Number 11 Two marks. XY and Company is a chartered firm with two partners Mr. X and Mr. Y. 
The firm was appointed auditor for 35 companies in the year 2017 and Mr. X was having total 19 audits in his name. Mr. Y was also partner in EFY and company where he was appointed auditor in four companies. On 4th August 2017, Mr. X met with an accident and died. The firm was reconstituted with Mr. Y as the proprietor of new firm and the audits of the new firm reduced to 16. The new firm, in which Mr. Y is the proprietor, accepted the audit of a private limited company having paid up capital of 52 rupees crores on 30th August 2017. EFY and company, another chartered firm, contended that Mr. Y cannot accept the appointment of private limited company as he has already crossed the ceiling of 20 company audits in that year. Do you think that EFY and company's claim is valid? EFY and company S claim is valid as MRY has already been appointed auditor for 20 companies i.e. 16 in the reconstituted firm and 4 in EFY and company. Mr. Y cannot accept the audit of private limited company in the year in which there is change in the constitution of firm, therefore the claim of EFY and company is valid. Mr. Y can accept the audit as the ceiling of 20 company audits is applicable for each firm in which the chartered accountant is a partner or proprietor. EFY and company S claim is void as the ceiling of 20 company audits doesn't include audit of private company having paid up capital less than 100 rupees crores. Answer. D. EFY and company. S claim is void as the ceiling of 20 company audits doesn't include audit of company having paid up capital less than 100 rupees crores. MTP April 2019 question number 7. 1 mark. One afternoon in the first week of June 2018, there was a heated discussion between the audit engagement partner of Shah and Associates and the finance director of Pecker and Company. The discussion was mainly on non-cooperation of the company staff to provide the relevant information to the auditors. The staff thought that the auditors were a hindrance in their routine work. The finance director called an urgent meeting to discuss the removal of the auditor Shah and Associates. Within the next week the partner of Shah and Associates was called and informed that they are no more the auditors of Pecker and Company comment if the removal of the auditor was proper in accordance with the Companies Act 2013. Yes, the finance director was correct in the procedure of the removal of auditors by a simple board meeting discussion. No, the removal of auditors before the expiry of the term should be done with the prior permission from the central government. Once appointed, the board of directors cannot remove the present auditors of the company. Yes, Pecker & Co. is not a government company. Hence the board of directors can remove the auditors by themselves. Answer. B. No. The removal of auditors before the expiry of the term should be done with the prior permission from the central government. MTP April 2019 Question number 8. 1 Mark. GERD Limited.
has declared dividend of 9% on 15th April 2018. For the year ended 31st March 2018. The company has not paid or the warrant in respect thereof has not been posted till date 30th June 2018 to any shareholder who is entitled to the payment of the dividend. Which of the following is correct in respect of the effect of non-payment of dividend? GERD Limited shall be liable to pay simple interest of 15% PA during the period for which the default continues. GERD Limited shall be liable to pay simple interest of 18% PA during the period for which the default continues. GERD Limited can still make the payment of dividend by 31st July 2018 with no interest applicable. GERD Limited can still make the payment of dividend by 15th July 2018 with no interest applicable. Answer B. GERD Limited shall be liable to pay simple interest of 18% PA during the period for which the default continues. MTP April 2019 Question number 9 1 Mark TSV and Company Chartered Accountants is an audit firm having two partners CAT and CAV. The firm TSV and Company is already holding an appointment as auditors of 36 public companies and none of the partners hold any company audits in their personal capacity or as partners with another firm. TSV and Company has been offered the appointment as auditors of seven more private limited companies. Of the seven, one is a company with a paid up share capital of 150 rupees crores. Five are small companies, as per the Companies Act, and one is a dormant company. Determine the number of companies out of seven for which TSV and company can accept the appointment as an auditor. Five. Six. 7. 1. Answer. C. 7. MTP April 2019 Question number 5. 1 Mark. FAC Chartered Accountants was appointed as statutory auditors by KMG Limited for the audit of their financial statements. During the course of audit, the auditors noticed a fraud of 120 rupees lakhs done by an officer of the company. The officer sanctioned and made the payment to fake vendors for purchase of fixed assets. However, the assets were not entered in the fixed assets register. The auditor reported the fraud in his audit report to the shareholders of the company presented in the annual general meeting, but did not mention the name of the parties involved. The board of directors of the company asked ICAI to take necessary action against the auditor as he has not complied with his duty to report fraud as per Section 143.12 of the Companies Act 2013. What is the duty of the auditor as per Companies Act in reporting the fraud done by officers or employees of the company? As per Companies Act 2013, as the amount of fraud is more than 100 lakhs, 
the auditor should have reported the matter within two days of his knowledge to the board of directors audit committee of the company seeking their reply or observations within 45 days. After completion of 45 days the auditor should forward his report to the central government along with the reply if any received from board audit committee. As per Companies Act, in the course of audit if the auditor has reason to believe that a fraud has been conducted by the officers or employees of the company, the auditor shall report the matter to the central government immediately. The auditor's duty is restricted to reporting the fraud to shareholders and he is not required to report the matter to Board of Directors Audit Committee Central Government. The auditor can submit his report on fraud to shareholders but is required to mention the name of the parties involved in fraud, as per Section 143.12 of the Companies Act, 2013. Answer. Option. A. As per Companies Act, 2013. As the amount of fraud is more than 100 lakhs, the auditor should have reported the matter within two days of his knowledge to the Board of Directors Audit Committee of the company seeking their reply or observations within 45 days. After completion of 45 days the auditor should forward his report to the central government along with the reply if any received from board audit committee. MTP October 2019 Question number 3 1 Mark Ope Limited issued a prospectus in respect of an IPO which had the auditor's report on the financial statements for the year ended 31st March 2019. The issue was fully subscribed. During this year, there was an abnormal rise in the profits of the company for which it was found later on that it was because of manipulated sales in which there was participation of whole time director and other top officials of the company. On discovery of this fact, the company offered to refund all monies to the subscribers of the shares and sued the auditors for the damages alleging that the auditors failed to examine and ascertain any satisfactory explanation for steep increase in the rate of profits and related accounts. The company emphasized that the auditor should have proceeded with suspicion and should not have followed selected verification. The auditors were able to prove that they found internal controls to be satisfactory and did not find any circumstance to arouse suspicion. The company was not able to prove that auditors were negligent in performance of their duties. Which of the following is correct? The stand of the company was correct in this case. Considering the nature of the work, the auditors should have proceeded with suspicion and should not have followed selected verification. The approach of the auditors looks reasonable in this case. The auditors found internal controls to be satisfactory and also did not find any circumstance to arouse suspicion and hence they performed their procedures on the basis of selected verification. In the given case, the auditors should have involved various experts along with them to help them on their audit procedures. Prospectus is one area wherein management involves various experts and hence the auditors should also have done that. In the given case, 
by not involving the experts the auditors did not perform their job in a professional manner. If they had involved experts like forensic experts, etc., the manipulation could have been detected. Hence the auditors should be held liable. In case of such type of engagements, the focus is always on the management controls. If the controls are found to be effective then an auditor can never be held liable in respect of any deficiency or misstatement or fraud. Answer. Option. B. The approach of the auditors looks reasonable in this case. The auditors found internal controls to be satisfactory and also did not find any circumstance to arouse suspicion and hence they performed their procedures on the basis of selected verification. MTP October 2019 Question number 12 2 Marks KIC Limited is a company engaged in the business of general insurance and has been in existence for over 15 years. The company has a subsidiary company, PIC Limited, which is also engaged in the business of insurance other than general insurance. The previous statutory auditors of PIC Limited have completed their tenure as an auditor and accordingly have resigned and the management of PIC Limited is looking for new statutory auditors. KB and Associates, a firm of chartered accountants, have vast experience of audit of insurance companies and would like to get appointed as auditor of PIC Limited. KB and Associates is a large firm and have also employed experts, engineers, valuers, lawyers for various client services. The firm is evaluating as to what should be the criteria for get appointed as auditors of PIC Limited because in the past, they have audited only the holding companies and considering a subsidiary company for the first time. In this context, please help the firm by answering which of the following options would be correct. KB and Associates, a firm of chartered accountants, should be appointed by the board of directors of PIC Limited and should ensure that they don't take up audit of more than two insurance companies. KB and Associates can take up the audit if the firm is appointed by the controller an Auditor General of India and should ensure that they don't take up audit of more than three insurance companies. KB and Associates cannot take audit of PIC Limited because they have employed experts which is not permitted by the ADI guidelines. KB and Associates can take up audit of PIC Limited by ensuring that they are eligible to be appointed as per the criteria laid down in the Companies Act 2013 for audit of subsidiary companies and they would need to submit a certificate in this respect to the ICAI. Answer B. KB and Associates can take up the audit if the firm is appointed by the controller and Auditor General of India and should ensure that they don't take up audit of more than three insurance companies. MTP October 2019 Question number 13 2 Marks KJ Private Limited has a business of pharmaceuticals and has an annual turnover of 1,500 rupees crores. During the last few years, considering the environment in which the company operates, its profit has reduced and is still falling. Hence the management has been looking at various ways to cut the costs. 
AD and Associates are the statutory auditors of the company and RM and Associates are the internal auditors of the company. Initially the company did not want to appoint any internal auditors to SF costs. However, at insistence of the statutory auditors, the company appointed the internal auditors. During the course of the statutory audit for the financial year ended 31st March 2019, the statutory auditors requested for the detailed working papers of the internal auditors which the internal auditors refused. However, the statutory auditors told the management if the same are not provided then they would qualify their report. In this situation, please advise which of the following would be correct. The statutory auditors should review the detailed working papers but they cannot qualify their report on this ground. The statutory auditors may review the detailed working papers and even after that they may qualify their report. The statutory auditors are not required to go to the extent of review of detailed working papers of internal auditors. The statutory auditors may review the detailed working papers of internal auditors but for that purpose they would require prior approval of the ICAI. Answer C. The statutory auditors are not required to go to the extent of review of detailed working papers of internal auditors. MTP October 2019 Question number 20 2 Marks AJ Private Limited was incorporated on 21st March 2018 and has limited operations. However, the capital induction in the company was huge because it would be capital intensive. The company is in the process to set up a plant in Karnataka which should be completed by 31st May 2019. The company's management prepared its financial statements for the year ended 31st March 2019. The auditors were also called to start the work in April 2019. The auditors would be able to complete their work by 31st May 2019 and accordingly would issue their audit report by first week of June 2019 as per the plan agreed with the management. The auditors have some observations related to preparations of financial statements which are not in compliance with Schedule 3 and most importantly the point related to capitalization of the plant as property. Plant and equipment in the financial statements for the year ended 31st March 2019. Please suggest which of the following statements would be correct. The compliance of Schedule 3 shall start from 1st April 2019 for this company as per company's accounts, amendment, rules 2016. The compliance of Schedule 3 shall start from 1st financial period, however, some exemptions would be applicable as per company's accounts rules 2014. There should be full compliance of Schedule 3 and plant should be kept as CWIP as per Schedule 3. There should be full compliance of Schedule 3 and plant should be shown as PPE as per Schedule 3. Answer C. There should be full compliance of Schedule 3 and plant should be kept as CWIP as per Schedule 3. 
RTP November 2019 Question number 6 The audit of Selby and Company is at the last stage, where your team member is looking at the presentation of items in the financial statements. You have instructed the team member to follow the general instructions given under Schedule 3 of the Companies Act, 2013 for the preparation and presentation of financial statements. The team member has shown you the following list where the company has not adhered to the general instructions given in Schedule 3. Which of the following from the list is not as per Division I of Schedule 3? The company had 32,500 in deferred tax liability and 12,500 in deferred tax asset arising from income taxes levied under the same governing taxation laws. The financial statements include both the above figures at non-current liabilities and non-current assets respectively. The company had a loss in the current year. This debit balance of statement of profit and loss was shown as a negative figure under the head, surplus, in the notes to the financial statements. In the current year the company had issued a performance guarantee and counter guarantees, but these were not disclosed as contingent liability in the notes in the financial statements. The company has clubbed all other expenses under the head, other expenses on the basis of 1% of the revenue from operations or 1 lakh whichever is hired to be disclosed separately. Answer. Option A. The company had 32,500 in deferred tax liability and 12,500 in deferred tax asset arising from income taxes levied under the same governing taxation laws. The financial statements include both the above figures at non-current liabilities and non-current assets respectively. Descriptive, detailed, question. May 20183, B, 5 marks. Beneath Minerals Limited is a public sector company engaged in extraction of minerals from land. It has to pump out water in the first layer of the soil if the minerals are to be excavated. The company pumps out water and diverts the water through a water course constructed by it to nearby villages and the water is allowed to be used by villagers for drinking purposes. The cost of construction of water course amounted to 5.25 crores and the company had disclosed this amount as CSR expenses in the statement of profit and loss. Comment Answer. Corporate Social Responsibility Expenses Company Corporate Social Responsibility Policy Rules 2014 mandated the corporate entities that the expenditure incurred for corporate social responsibility CSR should not be the expenditure incurred for the activities in the ordinary course of business. If expenditure incurred is for the activities in the ordinary course of business, then it will not be qualified as expenditure incurred on CSR activities. In the instant case, Beneath Minerals Limited is a public sector company which is engaged in extraction of mineral from land, for that it has to pump out water in the first layer of the soil if the minerals are to be excavated. 
The company pumps out water and diverts the water through a water course constructed by it to nearby villages and the water is allowed to be used by villagers for drinking purposes. Company has disclosed the cost of construction of water course as CSR expenses in the statement of profit and loss which is not correct as this expenditure incurred for the construction of water course is included in the ordinary course of activities of business. Therefore, the treatment done by showing the cost of construction of water course as CSR expense is not correct. May 2018-6, B, 4 marks, MTP April 19 question no 3, B, 4 marks. T and Company, a firm of chartered accountants had been appointed by C and H E to conduct statutory audit of MS Rare Airlines Limited, a public sector company. They would like to check certain mandatory propriety points as required under Section 143 1, of the Companies Act 2013. List the areas of check to meet these requirements. RTP November 2019 Question No. 25 B. Areas of Propriety Audit under Section 143, 1, of the Companies Act 2013. Answer. Mandatory Propriety Points under Section 143, 1, of the Companies Act 2013. The requirement of the provisions of Section 143, 1. Is essentially propriety oriented as much as some specific dubious, suspicious practices that are required to be looked into by the auditor. Areas of propriety audit under the provisions of Section 143 1 may be following whether the terms on which secured and unsecured advances have been made are prejudicial to the interests of the company or its members, whether transactions of the company which are represented merely by book entries are prejudicial to the interests of the company, whether investment of companies, other than a banking or an investment company, in the form of shares, debentures and other securities have been sold at a price lower than the cost. Whether loans and advances made by the company have been shown as deposits. Whether personal expenses have been charged to revenue. In case it is stated in the books and papers of the company that shares have been allotted for cash, whether cash has actually been received in respect of such allotment, and if no cash actually received, whether the position in books of account and balance sheet so stated is correct, regular and not misleading. 3 MTP Og 18 Question No. 3 C. 5 Marks Z Limited changed its employee remuneration policy from 1 April 2017 to provide for 12% contribution to Provident Fund on leave encashment also. As per the leave encashment policy the employees can either utilize or encash it. As at 31st March 2018 the company obtained an actuarial valuation for leave encashment liability. However, it did not provide for 12% PF contribution on it. The auditor of the company wants it to be provided but the management replied that as and when the employees availed leave encashment, 
the provident fund contribution was made. The company further contends that this is the correct treatment as it is not sure whether the employees will avail leave encashment or utilize it. Comment Answer As per para 11 of S15 on, employee benefits, issued by the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India, an enterprise should recognize the expected cost of short-term employee benefits in the form of compensated absences in the case of accumulating compensated absences, when the employees render service that increases their entitlement to future compensated absences. Since the company obtained actuarial valuation for leave encashment, it is obvious that the compensated absences are accumulating in nature. An enterprise should measure the expected cost of accumulating compensated absences as the additional amount that the enterprise expects to pay as a result of the unused entitlement that has accumulated at the balance sheet date. Here, Z Limited will accumulate the amount of leave encashment benefits as it is the liability of the company to provide 12% PF on amount of leave encashment. Hence the contention of the auditor is correct that full provision should be provided by the company. 4. RTP May 2018 Question No. 6 A. Excellent Limited, a company incorporated in India and listed with SABI, has a scheme for payment of settlement allowance to retiring employees. Under the scheme, retiring employees are entitled to reimbursement of certain travel expenses for the class they are entitled to as per company rules and regulations. Employees are also entitled to claim a lump sum payment to cover expenses on food and stay during the travel. The company also gives option to employees that they can claim a lump sum amount equal to three months pay last drawing. Excellent Limited have following accounting policies to record these travel expenses. Settlement allowance does not depend upon the length of service of employee. It is restricted to employees' eligibility under the travel rule of the company. Therefore, all travel expenses fall under the category of defined contribution plans. Since it is not related to the length of service of the employees, it is difficult to estimate reliably and there is no present obligation to pay employees as per S29 provisions, contingent liabilities and contingent assets, hence it is accounted for on claim basis. You are statutory auditor of Excellent Limited. What would be your guidance to audit team? Answer. Treatment of employee benefits expenses. The present case falls under the category of defined benefit scheme under S15, employee benefits. The said scheme includes cases where payment is promised to be made to an employee at or near retirement. Hence, there is significant difficulties in the determination of periodic charge to the statement of profit and loss. The contention of the company that the settlement allowance will be accounted for on claim basis is not correct even if company's obligation under the scheme is uncertain and requires estimation. In estimating the obligation, Assumptions may need to be made regarding future conditions and events, which are largely outside the company's control. Thus, 
Settlement allowance payable by the company is a defined retirement benefit, covered by S-15. A provision should be made every year in the accounts for the accruing liability on account of settlement allowance. The amount of provision should be calculated according to actuarial valuation. Where, however, the amount of provision so determined is not material, the company can follow some other method of accounting for settlement allowances. 5. RTP May 2018 Question No. 6. B. C. Limited. Appointed CA Innocent as a statutory auditor for the company for the current financial year. Further the company offered him the services of actuarial, investment advisory and investment banking which was also approved by the board of directors. Answer. Services not to be rendered by the auditor. Section 144 of the Companies Act, 2013 prescribes certain services not to be rendered by the auditor. An auditor appointed under this Act shall provide to the company only such other services as are approved by the Board of Directors or the Audit Committee, as the case may be but which shall not include any of the following services, whether such services are rendered directly or indirectly to the company or its holding company or subsidiary company, namely, RAID, Accounting and Bookkeeping Services, Actuarial Services, Internal Audit, Investment Advisory Services, Investment Banking Services Design and Implementation of Any Financial Information System Rendering of Outsourced Financial Services Management Services and Any Other Kind of Services as May Be Prescribed Further Section 141.3 I of the Companies Act 2013 also disqualify a person for appointment as an auditor of a company who is engaged as on the date of appointment in consulting and specialized services as provided in section 144. In the given case, CA Innocent was appointed as an auditor of C Limited. He was offered additional services of actuarial, investment advisory and investment banking which was also approved by the board of directors. The auditor is advised not to accept the services as these services are specifically notified in the services not to be rendered by him as an auditor as per section 144 of the Act. 6. RTP May 2018 Question No. 6. C. Ram Limited is a private company. Its balance sheet shows paid up share capital of 5 crore and public borrowings of 100 crore. The company appointed M.S. Shyam and Company, a chartered accountant firm, as the statutory auditor in its annual general meeting held at the end of September 2017 for 11 years. You are required to state the provisions related to rotation of auditors and cooling of period as per the section 139-2 of the Companies Act 2013 in case of an individual auditor or an audit firm, both, and comment upon the facts of the case provided above with respect to aforesaid provisions. Answer. A. 
rotation of auditor and cooling of period provisions, the provision related to rotation of auditor and cooling of period is covered by Section 139 of the Companies Act 2013 read with Rule 5 of the Companies Audit and Auditors Rules 2014 which is discussed as under. The provisions related to rotation of auditor are applicable to all listed companies. All unlisted public companies having paid up share capital of 10 rupees crore or more. All private limited companies having paid up share capital of 50 rupees crore or more. All companies having public borrowings from banks, financial institutions or public deposits of 50 rupees crores or more. Excluding one-person companies and small companies. As per Section 139-2 of the Companies Act 2013, a listed company or specified companies as mentioned above shall not appoint or reappoint an individual as auditor for more than one term of five consecutive years and an audit firm as auditor for more than two terms of five consecutive years. In the given case, Ram Limited is a private company having paid up share capital of 5 crore and public borrowings of 100 crore. The company has appointed M.S. Shyam and Company, a chartered accountant firm, as the statutory auditor in its AGM held at the end of September 2017 for 11 years. The provisions relating to rotation of auditor will be applicable as the public borrowings exceeds 50 crore. Therefore, Ram Private Limited can appoint M.S. Shyam and Company as an auditor of the company for not more than one term of five consecutive years twice i.e. M.S. Shyam and Company shall hold office from the conclusion of this meeting up to conclusion of 6th AGM to be held in the year 2022 and thereafter can be reappointed as auditor for one more term of five years i.e. up to year 2027. The appointment shall be subject to ratification by members at every annual general meeting of the company. As a result, the appointment of M.S. Shyam and Company made by Ram Limited for 11 years is void. 7. MTP March 2018 to C. 5 Marks New Study Mat. Just year difference. The balance sheet of G Limited. As at 31st March 2016 is as under. Comment on the presentation in terms of Schedule 3. Particulars. Note no. 31st March 16th. 31st March 15th. Equity and liabilities. Share capital. 1. Reserves and surplus. 2. 0. Employee stock option outstanding. 3. Share application money refundable. 4. Non-current liabilities. Deferred tax liability arising from Indian income tax. 5. Current liabilities. Trade payables. 6. Total. Assets. Non-current assets. Fixed assets tangible. 7. Queep, including capital advances. 8. 
current assets trade receivables 9 deferred tax asset arising from indian income tax 10 debit balance of statement of profit and loss total answer share capital and reserve and surplus are to be reflected under the heading shareholders funds which is not shown while preparing the balance sheet although it is a part of equity and liabilities yet it must be shown under head shareholders funds the heading shareholders funds is missing in the balance sheet given in the question reserve and surplus is showing zero balance which is not correct in the given case debit balance of statement of profit and loss should be shown as a negative figure under the head surplus the balance of reserves and surplus after adjusting negative balance of surplus shall be shown under the head reserves and surplus even if the resulting figure is in the negative schedule 3 requires that employee stock option outstanding should be disclosed under the heading reserves and surplus Share application money refundable shall be shown under the subheading Other current liabilities. As this is refundable and not pending for allotment, hence it is not a part of equity. Deferred tax liability has been correctly shown under non current liabilities. But deferred tax assets and deferred tax liabilities both cannot be shown in balance sheet at the same time because only the net balance of deferred tax liability or asset is to be shown under the main heading of non current assets fixed assets are further classified as under tangible assets intangible assets capital work in progress for Intangible assets under development. Keeping in view the above, the QIP shall be shown under fixed assets as capital work in progress. The amount of capital advances included in QIP shall be disclosed under the subheading Long Term Loans and Advances under the heading Non Current Assets. We deferred tax asset shall be shown under non-current asset. It should be the net balance of deferred tax asset after adjusting the balance of deferred tax liability. 6. Subsequent to the notification of Ministry of Corporate Affairs dated 11th October 2018 under Section 467 1 of the Companies Act 2013 trade payables should be disclosed as follows total outstanding dues of micro enterprises and small enterprises and total outstanding dues of creditors other than micro enterprises and small enterprises 8. MTP March 2018 Question No. 4. B. 4 Marks. The managing director of the company has committed a teaming and leading fraud. The amount involved has been, however, subsequently after the year end deposited in the company. As a statutory auditor, how would you deal? Answer. Fraud committed by managing director. The managing director of the company has committed a teaming and leading fraud.
The fact that the amount involved has been subsequently deposited after the year end is not important because the auditor is required to perform his responsibilities as laid down in SA 240. The auditor's responsibilities relating to fraud in an audit of financial statements. First of all, as per SA 240, the auditor needs to perform procedures whether the financial statements are free from material misstatement. Because an instance of fraud cannot be considered as an isolated occurrence and it becomes important for the auditor to perform audit procedures and revise the audit risk assessment. Secondly, the auditor needs to consider the impact of fraud on financial statements and its disclosure in the audit report. Thirdly, the auditor should communicate the matter to the chairman and board of directors. Finally, in view of the fact that the fraud has been committed at the highest level of management, it affects the reliability of audit evidence previously obtained since there is a genuine doubt about representations of management. Further, as per Section 143, 12 of the Companies Act 2013, if an auditor of a company, in the course of the performance of his duties as auditor, has reason to believe that an offence involving fraud is being or has been committed against the company by officers or employees of the company. He shall immediately report the matter to the central government, in case amount of fraud is 1 crore or above, or audit committee or board in other cases, in case the amount of fraud involved is less than. 1 crore, within such time and in such manner as may be prescribed. The auditor is also required to report as per clause 10 of paragraph 3 of CARO, 2016, whether any fraud by the company or any fraud on the company by its officers or employees has been noticed or reported during the year, if yes, the nature and the amount involved is to be indicated. 9. MTP April 18th Question No. 3. D. 5 Marks. As a statutory auditor of a company, comment on the accounting policy on revenue recognition for a company engaged in manufacture and sale of chemical products where it was stated that. Revenue is recognized only when it can be reliably measured and it is reasonable to expect ultimate collection. Answer Revenue Recognition As per AS9 Revenue Recognition, in a transaction involving the sales of goods, revenue should be recognized when the following conditions have been fulfilled. The seller of goods has transferred to the buyer the property in the goods for a price, or all significant risks and rewards of ownership have been transferred to the buyer, and the seller retains no effective control of the goods transferred to a degree usually associated with ownership, and no significant uncertainty exists regarding the amount of the consideration that will be derived from the sales of the goods. Therefore, revenue from sales transactions should be recognized when the requirements set out above is satisfied provided that at the time of performance it is not unreasonable to expect ultimate collection. If at the time of raising of any claim uncertainty regarding collection exists, then revenue recognition should be postponed. In the instant case, 
The company is engaged in manufacturing and sales of chemical products and made disclosure in accounting policy on recognition of revenue stating that revenue is recognized only when it can be reliably measured and it is reasonable to expect ultimate collection is not correct. As accounting policy disclosed is not covering the aspect of transfer of risk and reward for the purpose of revenue recognition. Therefore, auditor should modify the report accordingly. 10.RTP November 18th Question Number 6 Miranda Spinning Mills Limited is a sick company and has accumulated losses of 10 rupees crores. The company has 12 rupees crores in its share premium account. The management desires to adjust the accumulated losses against the share premium balance. Advise the company giving your reasons. Answer Application of share premium account Section 52 of the Companies Act 2013 deals with the application of premium received on issue of shares. Subsection 1 of the said section provides that where a company issues shares at a premium, whether for cash or otherwise, a sum equal to the aggregate amount of the premium received on those shares shall be transferred to an account called Securities Premium Account, and the provisions of this Act relating to reduction of share capital of a company except as provided in this section shall apply as if the Securities Premium Account was the paid-up share capital of the company. Subsection 2 of the said section provides that notwithstanding anything contained in subsection 1, securities premium account may be applied by the company for issue of bonus shares, writing of the preliminary expenses, writing of the expenses of or the commission paid or discount allowed on any issue of shares or debentures of the company. In providing for the premium payable on redemption of any redeemable preference shares or any debentures of the company. For the purchase of its own shares or other securities. In view of these provisions of the Companies Act 2013. It is not permitted to adjust its accumulated losses against the securities premium account. 11.RTP November 18th Question No. 6 B. Comment on the following with reference to Schedule 3 to the Companies Act 2013. Question. A company has disclosed performance guarantee and counter guarantees as contingent liabilities. A contingent liability in respect of guarantees arises when a company issues guarantees to another person on behalf of a third party, example, when it undertakes to guarantee the loan given to a subsidiary or to another company or gives a guarantee that another company will perform its contractual obligations. However, where a company undertakes to perform its own obligations, and for this purpose issues, what is called a guarantee, it does not represent a contingent liability and it is misleading to show such items as contingent liabilities in the balance sheet. For various reasons, it is customary for guarantees to be issued by bankers example, for payment of insurance premia, deferred payments to foreign suppliers, letters of credit, etc. For this purpose, the company issues a 
counter guarantee to its bankers. Such counter guarantee is not really a guarantee at all, but is an undertaking to perform what is in any event the obligation of the company, namely, to pay the insurance premium when demanded or to make deferred payments when due. Hence, such performance guarantees and counter guarantees should not be disclosed as contingent liabilities. Question The parent company has recognized in the current year's financial statement dividend declared by its subsidiary after the balance sheet date. The Schedule 3 does not prescribe to recognize dividend declared by subsidiary company as given in the scenario. Accordingly, dividend income from subsidiary companies should be recognized in accordance with AS-9 IE only when they have a right to receive the same on or before the balance sheet date. Normally, the right to receive is established only when the dividend is approved by the shareholder at the AGM of the investee company. Therefore, treatment done by the company is not in order. 13 MTP of 18 question no to C. 5 marks. Comment on the following with reference to Schedule 3 to the Companies Act 2013. Question. A company has disclosed performance guarantee and counter guarantees as contingent liabilities. A contingent liability in respect of guarantees arises when a company issues guarantees to another person on behalf of a third party, example, when it undertakes to guarantee the loan given to a subsidiary or to another company or gives a guarantee that another company will perform its contractual obligations. However, where a company undertakes to perform its own obligations, and for this purpose issues, what is called a guarantee, it does not represent a contingent liability and it is misleading to show such items as contingent liabilities in the balance sheet. For various reasons, it is customary for guarantees to be issued by bankers example, for payment of insurance premia, deferred payments to foreign suppliers, letters of credit, etc. For this purpose, the company issues a counter-guarantee to its bankers. Such counter-guarantee is not really a guarantee at all but is an undertaking to perform what is in any event the obligation of the company, namely, to pay the insurance premium when demanded or to make deferred payments when due. Hence, such performance guarantees and counter guarantees should not be disclosed as contingent liabilities. Question. A company has clubbed all other expenses under the head, other expenses, on the basis of 1% of total revenue or 5,000 rupees, whichever is higher. All other expenses not classified under other heads will be classified under other expenses. For this purpose, any item of expenditure which exceeds 1% of the revenue from operations or 1 lakh rupees, whichever is higher, needs to be disclosed separately. The given treatment in the scenario is not in order. Question. A company has shown deferred tax liability under non-current liabilities and deferred tax assets under non-current asset in balance sheet. Answer. Deferred tax liability should be shown under non-current liabilities.
deferred tax asset shall be shown under non-current asset. But deferred tax assets and deferred tax liabilities, both, cannot be shown in balance sheet at the same time because only the net balance of deferred tax liability or asset is to be shown. Thus, DTA and DTL shown separately in the balance sheet by the company is not correct. 14 MTP October 18 Question No. 3 C. 5 Marks Z Limited has flexi deposit linked to current account with various banks. Checks are issued from the current account and as per the requirements of funds, the flexi deposits are encashed and transferred to current accounts. As of 31st March 2018 certain checks issued to vendors are not presented for payment resulting in the credit balance in the books of the company. The management wants to present the book overdraft under current liabilities and flexi deposits under cash and bank balances. Comment Answer Presentation of book overdraft as per Schedule 3 to the Companies Act 2013, the instructions in accordance with which current assets being cash and cash equivalents should be made out to Part I of Schedule 3 to the Companies Act 2013 states as follows. Cash and cash equivalents shall be classified as Balances with banks Checks Drafts on hand Cash on hand Others Specify nature Earmarked balances with banks For example For unpaid dividend Shall be separately stated Balances with banks to the extent held as margin money or security against the borrowings, guarantees, other commitments shall be disclosed separately. Repatriation restrictions, if any, in respect of cash and bank balances shall be separately stated. Bank deposits with more than 12 months maturity shall be disclosed separately. From the facts of the case, it is evident that in substance the position is that the composite bank balance including the balance in flexi deposit accounts are positive, even though physical set-off has not been made as on the balance sheet date. Further the bank has got the right to set off of flexi deposits against the checks issued and hence it would be more informative and useful to the readers of the financial statements to disclose the book credit balance as a set off from the flexi deposit accounts. The disclosure of the said book credit balance as book overdraft under the head current liabilities as proposed by the management is not correct. 15 November 18th Question No. 2 C. 5 Marks During the financial year ended on 31st March 2018, LM Private Limited had borrowed from a nationalized bank a term loan of 120 lakhs consisting of 100 lakhs for purchase of a machinery for the new plant and 20 lakhs for erection expenses. As on the date of 31st March 2018, the total of capital and free reserves of the company was 50 lakhs and turnover for the year 2017 to 18 was 750 lakhs. The bank paid 100 lakhs to the vendor of the company for the supply of machinery on 31st December 2017.
the machinery had reached the yard of the company. On 28 February 2018, the company had drawn the balance of loan with 20 rupees lakhs to the credit of its current account maintained with the bank and utilized the full amount for renovating its administrative office building. The machinery had been kept as capital stock under construction. Comment as to reporting issues, if any, that the auditor should be concerned with for the financial year ended on 31st March 2018, in this respect. Answer. Applicability of CARO. 2016 and utilization of term loan, CARO, 2016 specifically exempts a private limited company, not being a subsidiary company of a public company, having a paid up capital, reserves and surplus not more than rupees 1 crore as on balance sheet date and which does not have total borrowing exceeding rupees 1 crore from any bank or financial institution at any point of time during the year and which does not have a total revenue as disclosed in Schedule 3 to the companies. Act 2013 exceeding 10 rupees crore during the financial year as per financial statements. In the case of LM Private Limited, it has paid up capital of rupees 50 lakhs, which is below the specified limit of rupees 1 crore, and turnover is rupees 7.5 crore, which is also less than specified rupees 10 crore. However, there is total borrowing of rupees 1.20 crore which is more than rupees 1 crore and exceeding the specified limits of rupees 1 crore. Hence CARO 2016 will be applicable to LM Private Limited. As per clause 9 of Para 3 of CARO 2016 an auditor needs to state in his report that whether the term loans were applied for the purpose for which the loans were obtained. If not, the details together with delays or default and subsequent rectification, if any, as may be applicable, be reported. For this the auditor should examine the terms and conditions subject to which the company has obtained the term loans. The auditor may also examine the proposal for grant of loan made to the bank. As mentioned above, normally, the end use of the funds raised by term loans is mentioned in the sanction letter or documents containing the terms and conditions of the loan. The auditor should ascertain the purpose for which term loans were sanctioned. The auditor should also compare the purpose for which term loans were sanctioned with the actual utilization of the loans. The auditor should obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence regarding the utilization of the amounts raised. If the auditor finds that the funds have not been utilized for the purpose for which they were obtained, the auditor's report should state the fact. In the present case, the term loan obtained by LM Private Limited amounting rupees 20 lakhs have not been utilized for erection expenses instead it's utilized for renovating its administrative office building. Further, assuming that erection work has not been done and machinery is not being installed, Disclosure of the same as capital stock under construction is in order. Here, the auditor should report the fact in his report that pending utilization of the term loan for erection expenses, 
The funds were temporarily used for the purpose other than the purpose for which the loan was sanctioned as per clause 9 of Para 3 of Caro, 2016. 16 November 18th Question No. 3. C. ABC Limited is in the practice of maintaining consistent dividend payment over a minimum of 14%. The financial year 2017 to 18 was so very bad for the company that it was not possible for the company to maintain the payment of consistent dividend as above. The management being hopeful of recovery of its performance in next year, felt that the depreciation of the year to the extent of 75% alone be charged to the statement of profit and loss and the remaining 25% be kept in a separate account code in the balance sheet, debit balances adjustable against revenue account. The management was of the view that it would be in fair practice of accounting if the depreciation for asset is charged before the expiry of the life of assets and the amount parked in asset code as above would unfailingly be adjusted to revenue before the close of next financial year anyway. Analyze the issues involved and state how the auditor should decide on this matter. Answer. Provision of Depreciation, Section 123, 1, of the Companies Act 2013 provides that dividend cannot be declared or paid by a company for any financial year except out of profits of the company for that year arrived at after providing for depreciation in accordance with the provisions of Section 123. 2 or out of the profits of the company for any previous financial year or years arrived at after providing for depreciation in the aforesaid manner and remaining undistributed, or out of both. Further, it is the duty of auditor to check whether the depreciation was provided according to provision of AS10 Indian Accounting Standard 16 and Schedule 2 to the Act. In the instant case, ABC Limited is in the practice of maintaining consistent dividend payment over a minimum of 14%. Due to bad financial condition, company has not provided for dividend for the year 2017 to 18 in addition to this management has also taken decision to charge 75% of the depreciation in the statement of profit and loss whereas 25% of the depreciation amount kept in a separate account code in the balance sheet Debit balances adjustable against revenue account. Contention of management that it would be in fair practice of accounting where the depreciation of asset is charged before the expiry of the life of assets and the amount parked in asset code would unfailingly be adjusted to revenue before the close of next financial year is not tenable. The practice of the company in not charging the depreciation and accumulating 25% of it in a debit balance for being written off in the next year is not an acceptable accounting treatment. If dividend is declared in such situation, it would mean payment out of capital. Therefore, the auditor of the company should ensure the compliance of provisions of Section 123 and Schedule 2.
In case the management does not comply with the provisions and does not charge the 100% depreciation the auditor of the company shall suggest the management for the same and if management refuses, the auditor should qualify his report accordingly. 17.RTP May 2019 Question No. 15 A. MKC LLP is a newly set up LLP, Limited Liability Partnership. The operations of the LLP have been picking up and management is currently in the process of setting up processes and procedures in place. As per the understanding of the management of the LLP, its accounts would not be required to be audited mandatory because of its operations but still the management has decided that they would get the accounts audited voluntarily. In this regard, the management would like to understand some of the aspects which they should consider not only limited to audit but also about the maintenance of books of accounts as per the relevant laws. Please advise. Answer. An LLP shall be under obligation to maintain annual accounts reflecting true and fair view of its state of affairs. The accounts of every LLP shall be audited in accordance with Rule 24 of LLP Rules 2009. Such rules, inter alia, provides that any LLP whose turnover does not exceed 40 lakh rupees in any financial year, or whose contribution does not exceed 25 lakh rupees is not required to get its accounts audited. However, if the partners of such limited liability partnership decide to get the accounts of such LLP audited, the accounts shall be audited only in accordance with such rule. Appointment of Auditor the auditor may be appointed by the designated partners of the LLP at any time for the first financial year but before the end of first financial year. At least 30 days prior to the end of each financial year, other than the first financial year. To fill the casual vacancy in the office of auditor. To fill the casual vacancy caused by removal of auditor, the partners may appoint the auditors if the designated partners have failed to appoint them. LLPs are required to maintain books of accounts which shall contain particulars of all sums of money received and expended by the LLP and the matters in respect of which the receipt and expenditure takes place. A record of the assets and liabilities of the LLP. Statements of costs of goods purchased, inventories, work in progress, finished goods and costs of goods sold. Any other particulars which the partners may decide. Auditor's duty regarding audit of LLP. The auditor should get definite instructions in writing as to the work to be performed by him. The auditor should mention. A. Whether the records of the firm appear to be correct and reliable. B whether he was able to obtain all information and explanation necessary for his work. c. Whether any restrictions has been imposed upon him. The auditor should read the LLP agreement and note the following provisions. Nature of the business of the LLP. Amount of capital contributed by each partner. Interest in respect of additional capital contributed. Duration of partnership. 
drawings allowed to the partners. Salaries, commission etc. payable to partners. Borrowing powers of the LLP. Rights and duties of partners. Method of settlement of accounts between partners at the time of admission, retirement, admission etc. Any loans advanced by the partners. Profit sharing ratio. 18. RTP May 19th question no 15. B. ARK Limited is a large-sized listed company having annual turnover of INR 4000 crores. The company also has a plan to get listed on New York Stock Exchange next year. The company has paid good amount of dividend during the year to its shareholders, which is significantly higher as compared to earlier years. The statutory auditors would like to focus on this aspect at the time of their statutory audit. Please advise the relevant procedures that the statutory auditors should perform in respect of this area. Answer. The auditor should obtain appropriate audit evidence as regard to audit of payment of dividends. The procedures include Check whether dividend was declared out of profits arrived at after providing for depreciation as per section 123. 2. Check whether The depreciation was provided according to provisions of Schedule 2 to the Companies Act, 2013. A board resolution recommending dividend was passed. The dividend was declared only in the AGM. The dividend declared in the general meeting does not exceed the amount recommended by the board. Register of members was closed as per the provisions of Section 91 of the Companies Act, 2013. Dividend has been paid in the prescribed manner within 30 days of time to the registered holder or to their order. Section 127. Amount of dividend deposited in a separate bank account within 5 days from the date of declaration of dividend. Intimation sent to stock exchange. In case of listed company. Were there any complaints regarding non-payment or delay in payment of dividend? If so, whether corrective action was taken? Examine that the accounting and disclosure procedures have been complied with related to the declaration and payment of dividend like depreciation has been provided before declaration, Disclosure has been made by way of notes to the accounts, etc. Inspect that the dividend has been paid only out of free reserves, i.e. the reserves which, as per the latest audited balance sheet of a company, are available for distribution as dividend except any amount representing unrealized gains, Notional gains or revaluation of assets, whether shown as a reserve or otherwise, or any change in carrying amount of an asset or of a liability recognized in equity, including surplus in statement of profit and loss on measurement of the asset or the liability at fair value as laid down under third proviso to section 123, 1, read with section 2, 43, of the Act. If dividend has been paid out of accumulated profits, earned by it in previous years and transferred to the reserves, in case of inadequacy or absence of profits in any financial years, 
verify that the rules related to such distribution has been complied with, i.e. the maximum amount allowable to be distributed as a dividend in case of inadequate or no profit as required by second proviso to section 123, 1, of the Act. Check the procedures that have been followed for the payment of unclaimed dividend out of unpaid dividend account. Verify that, if any money transferred to unpaid dividend account has remained unpaid or unclaimed for a period of seven years from the date of such transfer then, whether it has been transferred by the company along with interest accrued if any, thereon to the Investor Education and Protection Fund established under Section 125, 1, of the Act and a statement regarding such transfer has also been sent to the authority which administers such fund. In case the company has outsourced the activity to the service organization, Check that all the compliances with laws, regulations, accounting and disclosure related to the dividends have been made appropriately. 19. May 2019 Question No. 4. B. 4 Marks. PQ and Company is an audit firm with P and Q as partners. For the financial year 2018-19, the firm has been appointed as statutory auditor of M.S. Mango Orchards Hotel Limited. The audit firm is a regular customer of the hotel and the partners usually stay in the same hotel at various locations in the course of traveling for their various professional assignments. Normally, payments for such stay are settled against quarterly bills raised by the company. Give your comment with respect to the Companies Act 2013. Answer. Indebtedness to the company, according to the Section 141, 3, D, 2, of the Companies Act, 2013, a person who is indebted to the company for an amount exceeding 5 lakhs shall be disqualified to act as an auditor of such company and further under section 141, 4, he shall vacate his office of auditor when he incurs this disqualification subsequent to his appointment. Further a person or a firm who directly or indirectly has business relationship with a company or its subsidiary or its holding or associate company is also not qualified to be appointed as auditor of the company. But here business relationship does not include commercial transactions which are in the ordinary course of the business of the company at arm's length price. However, where the person has liquidated his debt before the appointment date, there is no disqualification to be construed for such appointment. In the given case, PQ and Company an audit firm with P and Q as partners is appointed as statutory auditor of M.S. Mango Orchards Hotel Limited, And the audit firm is a regular customer of the hotel and the partners usually stay in the same hotel at various locations. They also settle the payments for such stay against quarterly bills raised by the company. Assuming the balance amount at any time during the year due to the hotel does not exceed the prescribed limits of Rs 5 lakhs, PQ and Company is not disqualified to be appointed as statutory auditor of M.S. Mango Orchards Hotel Limited as per Section 141.
3, d, 2. In the absence of the same, the auditor shall be disqualified to act as an auditor and shall vacate his office of auditor when he incurs this disqualification subsequent to the appointment. Since in term of section 141, 3, e, of Companies Act, 2013 PQ and company is not a person or a firm who, whether directly or indirectly, has business relationship with the company, or its subsidiary, or its holding or associate company or subsidiary of such holding company or associate company of such nature as may be prescribed. The auditor shall not be disqualified to act as an auditor and shall not require to vacate his office of auditor. 20. May 2019 Question No. 6 A. 5 Marks Per Limited Is an exporter of precious and semi-precious stones. The turnover of the company is 150 crore, out of which 105 crore is from export business and remaining 45 rupees crore from domestic sales. Amount received from export business is all in foreign currency. Directors of Pearl Limited are of the opinion that cost audit is not applicable to their company as maximum revenue has been generated from export business. Give your opinion. Answer. Cost audit rules not to apply in certain cases. The requirement for cost audit shall not be applicable to a company whose revenue from exports in foreign exchange exceeds 75% of its total revenue, which is operating from CIS and which is engaged in the generation of electricity for captive consumption through captive generating plant. As per Rule 3 of the Companies, Cost Records and Audit, Rules, 2014. In the instant case, Per Limited is an exporter of precious and semi-precious stones and the turnover of the company is rupees 150 crore out of which rupees 105 crore i.e. 70% is from export business and remaining rupees 45 crore i.e. 30% from domestic sales. It is neither operating from CIS nor involved in captive power generation. Thus, opinion of director is not tenable as revenue from exports in foreign exchanges is below prescribed limit. Therefore, cost audit is applicable on per limited. As per Rule 3 of the companies, cost records and audit rules 2014. Per Limited has to appoint cost auditor to get the cost accounts of the company audited. 21.RTP November 2019 Question number 15 MTP October 2018 Question No. 2 C. 4 Marks ABC and Company is an audit firm having partners, Mr. A, Mr. B, and Mr. C, chartered accountants. Mr. A, Mr. B, and Mr. C, are holding appointment as an auditor in 4, 6 and 10 companies respectively. Provide the maximum number of audits remaining in the name of ABC and Company. Provide the maximum number of audits remaining in the name of individual partner i.e. Mr. A, Mr. B and Mr. C. 
Can ABC and Company accept the appointment as an auditor in 60 private companies having paid up share capital less than 100 crore which has not committed default in filing its financial statements under Section 137? or annual return under Section 92 of the Companies Act with the Registrar, two small companies and one dormant company. Would your answer be different if out of those 60 private companies, 45 companies are having paid up share capital of 110 crore each? Fact of the case in the instant case, Mr. A is holding appointment in four companies, whereas Mr. B is having appointment in six companies and Mr. C is having appointment in ten companies. In aggregate all three partners are having 20 audits. Provisions and Explanations As per Section 141, 3 G. Of the Companies Act 2013, a person shall not be eligible for appointment as an auditor if he is in full-time employment elsewhere, or is a partner of a firm holding appointment as an auditor of more than 20 companies other than one-person companies, dormant companies, Small companies and private companies having paid up share capital less than 100 crore. Private company which has not committed a default in filing its financial statements under Section 137 or annual return under Section 92 with the Registrar. As per Section 141, 3. G. This limit of 20 company audits is per person. In the case of an audit firm having three partners, the overall ceiling will be 3 times 20 is equal to 60 company audits. Sometimes, a chartered accountant is a partner in a number of auditing firms. In such a case, all the firms in which he is partner or proprietor will be together entitled to 20 company audits on his account. Conclusion Therefore, ABC and company can hold appointment as an auditor of 40 more companies. Total number of audits available to the firm is equal to 20 asterisk 3 is equal to 60 number of audits already taken by all the partners. In their individual capacity is equal to 4 plus 6 plus 10 is equal to 20. Remaining number of audits available to the firm is equal to 40. With reference to above provisions an auditor can hold more appointment as auditor is equal to ceiling limit as per section 141, 3, g. Already holding appointments as an auditor. Hence, 1. Mr. A can hold, 20 to 4 is equal to 16 more audits. 2. Mr. B can hold 20 to 6 is equal to 14 more audits and 3. Mr. C can hold 20 to 10 is equal to 10 more audits. In view of above discussed provisions, ABC and company can hold appointment as an auditor in all the 60 private companies having paid up share capital less than 100 rupees crore, private company which has not committed a default in filing its financial statements under Section 137 of the said Act or annual return under Section 92 of the said Act with the Registrar. 
two small companies and one dormant company as these are excluded from the ceiling limit of company audits given under section 141.3.g of the Companies Act 2013. As per fact of the case, ABC and company is already having 20 company audits and they can also accept 40 more company audits. In addition, they can also conduct the audit of one-person companies, small companies, dormant companies and private companies having paid up share capital less than 100 crores. Private company which has not committed a default in filing its financial statements under Section 137 of the said Act or annual return under Section 92 of the said Act with the Registrar. In the given case, out of the 60 private companies ABC and company is offered, 45 companies having paid up share capital of 110 crore each. Therefore, ABC and company can also accept the appointment as an auditor for two small companies, one dormant company, 15 private companies having paid up share capital less than 100 crore private company which has not committed a default in filing its financial statements under Section 137 of the said Act or annual return under Section 92 of the said Act with the Registrar, and 40 private companies having paid up share capital of 100 and 10 crore each in addition to above 20 company audits already. Holding 22.MTP October 2019 Question No. 6 B. 5 Marks As an auditor, how would you deal with the following situations? Nick Limited is a subsidiary of Ajinta Limited whose 20% shares have been held by central government, 25% by Uttar Pradesh government and 10% by Madhya Pradesh government. Nick Limited appointed Mr. Prem as its statutory auditor. Answer According to Section 1397, of the Companies Act 2013, the auditors of a government company shall be appointed or reappointed by the Controller and Auditor General of India, C and AG. As per Section 2, 45, a government company is defined as any company in which not less than 51% of the total voting power is held by the central government or by any state government or governments or partly by the central government and partly by one or more state governments and includes a company which is a subsidiary of a government company. In the given case, Ajinta Limited is a government company as its 20% shares have been held by central government, 25% by UP state government and 10% by MP state government. Total 55% shares have been held by central and state governments. Therefore, it is a government company. Nick Limited is a subsidiary company of Ajinta Limited. Hence, Nick Limited is covered in the definition of a government company. Therefore, auditor of Nick Limited can be appointed only by C and AG. Consequently, Appointment of Mr. Prem is invalid and he should not give acceptance to the directors of Nick Limited. Contravene Limited. 
appointed CA Innocent as an auditor for the company or the current financial year. Further, the company offered him the services of actuarial, investment advisory and investment banking which was also approved by the board of directors. Answer Services not to be rendered by the auditor, Section 144 of the Companies Act, 2013 prescribes certain services not to be rendered by the auditor. An auditor appointed under the Act shall provide to the company only such other services as are approved by the Board of Directors or the Audit Committee as the case may be, but which shall not include any of the following services, whether such services are rendered directly or indirectly to the company or its holding company or subsidiary company, namely, accounting and bookkeeping services, actuarial services, internal audit, Investment Advisory Services Investment Banking Services Design and Implementation of any Financial Information System Rendering of Outsourced Financial Services Management Services and Any other kind of services as may be prescribed Further Section 141 3. I. of the Companies Act, 2013 also disqualifies a person for appointment as an auditor of a company who is engaged as on the date of appointment in consulting and specialized services as provided in Section 144. In the given case, C.A. Innocent was appointed as an auditor of Contraveen Limited. He was offered additional services of actuarial, investment advisory and investment banking which was also approved by the board of directors. The auditor is advised not to accept the services as these services are specifically notified in the services not to be rendered by him as an auditor as per section 144 of the Act. 23. RTP November 2019 Question No. 15. B. Vision Limited decided to appoint Mr. Rajveer, Chartered Accountant, as the branch auditor for the audit of its Lucknow branch accounts for the year 2018-19. The decision to appoint branch auditor was taken by way of board resolution in the meeting of board of directors of the company held in April 2018, subject to shareholders' approval in AGM of the company scheduled to be held in June 2018. Meanwhile, the principal auditor of the company raised an objection that the branch auditor cannot be appointed without his consent. Advice whether the objection raised by company auditor is valid. Answer Appointment of Branch Auditor Section 143 8 of the Companies Act 2013 prescribes the duties and powers of the company's auditor with reference to the audit of the branch and the branch auditor. Where a company has a branch office, the accounts of that office shall be audited either by the auditor appointed for the company, herein referred to as the company's auditor, under this act or by any other person qualified for appointment as an auditor of the company under this act and appointed as such under section 139. In case of subsequent appointment of auditor, 
Section 1391 of the Act provides that every company shall, at the first annual general meeting, appoint an individual or a firm as an auditor who shall hold office from the conclusion of that meeting till the conclusion of its sixth annual general meeting. In the instant case, Vishn Limited decided to appoint Mr. Rajveer, chartered accountant, as the branch auditor for the audit of its Lucknow branch accounts and the decision to appoint branch auditor was taken by way of board resolution in the meeting of board of directors of the company subject to shareholders approval in AGM of the company. Thus, objection raised by company auditor is not valid as per section 143. 8 of the Companies Act 2013 and the board has authority to appoint branch auditor but should be approved by shareholders in general meeting. 24 MTP April 19 Question No. 2 B. 5 Marks Director, Finance, of Alpha Limited is of the opinion that total trade payables mentioned in the financial statement is sufficient disclosure in the balance sheet as per Part I of Schedule 3 to the Companies Act 2013. They did not mention details regarding micro, small and medium enterprises, MSME. Give your view as statutory auditor of the company and state the details required to be disclosed in notes regarding MSME. Answer. Details required to be disclosed in notes regarding MSME. Opinion of Director. Finance of Alpha Limited that total trade payables mentioned in the financial statement is sufficient disclosure in the balance sheet as per Part I of Schedule 3 to the Companies Act 2013 is not correct. The following details relating to micro Small and medium enterprises shall be disclosed by Alpha Limited in the notes. The principal amount and the interest due thereon, to be shown separately, remaining unpaid to any supplier at the end of each accounting year. The amount of interest paid by the buyer as per micro, small and medium enterprises development act 2006 along with the amount of the payment made to the supplier beyond the appointed day during each accounting year the amount of interest due and payable for the period of delay in making payment which have been paid but beyond the appointed day during the year but without adding the interest specified under the Micro, Small and Medium Enterprises Development Act 2006. The amount of interest accrued and remaining unpaid at the end of each accounting year, and the amount of further interest remaining due and payable even in the succeeding years until such date when the interest dues above are actually paid to the small enterprise for the purpose of disallowance of a deductible expenditure as per micro, small and medium enterprises development act, 2006. 24A May 2018 6 B 4 marks MTP April 19 question no 3 B 4 marks T and Company a firm of chartered accountants had been appointed by C and A G to conduct statutory audit of MS Rare Airlines Limited a public sector company they would like to check certain mandatory propriety points as required under Section 143, 
one of the Companies Act 2013. List the areas of check to meet these requirements. RTP November 2019 Question No. 25 B. Areas of Propriety Audit under Section 143 1 of the Companies Act 2013. Answer Mandatory Propriety Points under Section 143 1 of the Companies Act 2013, the requirement of the provisions of Section 143, 1, is essentially propriety-oriented as much as some specific dubious, suspicious, practices that are required to be looked into by the auditor. Areas of propriety audit under the provisions of Section 143, 1, may be following. Whether the terms on which secured and unsecured advances have been made are prejudicial to the interests of the company or its members. Whether transactions of the company which are represented merely by book entries are prejudicial to the interests of the company. Whether investment of companies, other than a banking or an investment company, in the form of shares, debentures and other securities have been sold at a price lower than the cost. Whether loans and advances made by the company have been shown as deposits. Whether personal expenses have been charged to revenue. In case it is stated in the books and papers of the company that shares have been allotted for cash, whether cash has actually been received in respect of such allotment, and if no cash actually received, whether the position in books of account and balance sheet so stated is correct, regular and not misleading. 25.No2019 Question No. 2 B. 5 Marks CAX was appointed by DP Limited as statutory auditor. While doing the audit of DP Limited CAX observed that certain loans and advances were made without proper securities, certain trade receivables and trade payables were adjusted into say, and personal expenses were charged to revenue. As a company auditor comment on the reporting responsibilities of CAX. Answer a. Duty of Auditor to Inquire on Certain Matters, Section 143, 1, of the Companies Act 2013 requires the auditor to make an inquiry in respect of specified matters during the course of his audit. Since the law requires the auditor to make an inquiry, the Institute opined that the auditor is not required to report on the matters specified in subsection 1 unless he has any special comments to make on any of the items referred to therein. If the auditor is satisfied with the result of the inquiries, he has no further duty to report that he is so satisfied. It is to be noted that the auditor is required to make only inquiries and not investigate into the matters referred to therein. The opinion of the Research Committee of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India on Section 143, 1, of the Companies Act 2013 is worth considering and reproduced below. The auditor is not required to report on the matters specified in subsection 1 
unless he has any special comments to make on any of the items referred to therein. If he is satisfied with the result of the inquiries, he has no further duty to report that he is so satisfied. In such a case, the content of the auditor's report will remain exactly the same as the auditor has to inquire and apply his mind to the information elicited by the inquiry. In deciding whether or not any reference needs to be made in his report. In our opinion, it is in this light that the auditor has to consider his duties under Section 143.1. Clause A of Section 1431 requires the auditor to inquire whether loans and advances made by the company on the basis of security have been properly secured and whether the terms on which they have been made are prejudicial to the interests of the company or its members. If the auditor finds that the loans and advances have not been properly secured, he may enter an adverse comment in the report but cannot probably doubt the true view of the accounts by reference to this fact so long the loans and advances are properly described and presented in terms of Part I of Schedule 3 to the Companies Act. Further the auditor to inquire whether or not the terms on which the loans or advances have been made are prejudicial to the interests of the company or its members. If it is, he should qualify his report. If trade receivables and trade payables are adjusted into say, this amounts to merely book entries. The auditor as per clause B of Section 143.1, should inquire whether transactions of the company which are represented merely by book entries are prejudicial to the interests of the company. This proposition has got to be inquired into by reference to the effects of the book entries, unsupported by transactions, on the legitimate interests of the company. The auditor has to exercise his judgment based on certain objective standards. Regarding personal expenses, Clause E of Section 143.1 requires the auditor to inquire whether personal expenses have been charged to revenue account. The charging to revenue of such personal expenses, either on the basis of the company's contractual obligations, or in accordance with accepted business practice, is perfectly normal and legitimate or does not call for any special comment by the auditor. Where, however, personal expenses not covered by contractual obligations or by accepted business practice are incurred by the company and charged to revenue account, it would be the duty of the auditor to report thereon. It is sufficient to say that if the auditor finds that personal expenses have been charged to revenue and if the amounts are material, he should qualify his report also. 26 MTP Og 18 Question No. 1 B. 5 Marks As an auditor of a company registered under Section 8 of the Companies Act 2013 you find that as per the notification of the Ministry of Corporate Affairs regarding applicability of Indian accounting standards, in as the company has to prepare its financial statements for the year ended 31st March 2018 under Ind Accounting Standard. 
The management of the company is however of the strong view that being a Section 8 company having charitable objects, in as cannot apply to the company. The financial statements are therefore prepared by the management under the earlier GAP and a note for the same is given in the financial statements. How would you report on these financial statements? MTP October 18 question No. 3, B, 5 marks, November 2019 question No. 3, A, 5 marks. As an auditor of a company registered under Section 8 of the Companies Act 2013, you find that as per the notification of the Ministry of Corporate Affairs regarding applicability of Indian According Standards, in as, the company has to prepare its financial statements for the year ended 31st March 2019 under Ind Accounting Standard. The management of the company is, however, of the strong view that being a Section 8 company having charitable objects, in as cannot apply to the company. The financial statements are, therefore, prepared by the management under the earlier GAP and a note for the same is given in the financial statements. How would you report on these financial statements? Answer. Applicability of Indian Accounting Standard, Section 129-1 of the Companies Act 2013 governs the requirements to be satisfied by financial statements. The provisions thereunder which should be complied with are Financial statements shall give a true and fair view of the state of affairs of the company or companies as at the end of financial year, comply with the notified accounting standards under Section 133 and be in such form or forms specified in Schedule 3 to the Companies Act 2013 and the items contained in such financial statements shall be in accordance with the accounting standards. Further, as per Section 133 of the Companies Act 2013, the central government has notified companies, Indian Accounting Standards, Rules, 2015 dated 16th February 2015 in exercise of the powers conferred by section 133. The said rules list the Indian accounting standards, Indian accounting standard, and the class of companies required to comply with the Indian accounting standard while preparation of their financial statements. Here, it may be noted that the companies covered under Section 8 are required to comply the provisions of the Companies Act 2013 unless and until any exemption is provided. Therefore, companies registered under Section 8 are not exempted from the requirements of Section 133 and Section 129 of the Companies Act 2013. In the given case, only contention of management that being a Section 8 company having charitable object in as cannot apply to the company, therefore financial statements prepared under the earlier GAP and a note for the same is given, is not tenable. However, 
the auditor is required to ensure the applicable monetary limits w.r.t and as a need to advise the management to prepare the financial statements as per in as accordingly. In case of non-compliance the auditor should report accordingly. Study Material 1. The Balance Sheet of G Limited as at 31st March 1920 is as under. Comment on the presentation in terms of Schedule 3. Heading Note No. 31st March 1920 31st March 2019 Equity and Liabilities Share Capital Reserves and surplus employee stock option outstanding share application money refundable non-current. Liabilities Deferred tax liability arising from Indian income tax. Current liabilities. Trade payables. Total. Assets. Non-current assets. Fixed assets tangible. Queep, including capital advances. Current assets. Trade receivables. Deferred tax asset, arising from Indian income tax. Debit balance of statement of. Profit and loss. Total. 1. 2. 3. 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 0. Answer. Following errors are noticed in presentation as per Schedule 3. Share capital and reserve and surplus are to be reflected under the heading, Shareholders Funds which is not shown while preparing the balance sheet. Although it is a part of equity and liabilities yet it must be shown under head, shareholders funds. The heading, shareholders funds, is missing in the balance sheet given in the question. Reserve and surplus is showing zero balance, which is not correct in the given case. Debit balance of statement of profit and loss should be shown as a negative figure under the head, surplus. The balance of reserves and surplus, after adjusting negative balance of surplus shall be shown under the head, reserves and surplus even if the resulting figure is in the negative. Schedule 3 requires that employee stock option outstanding should be disclosed under the heading, Reserves and Surplus. Share application money refundable shall be shown under the subheading, Other current liabilities. As this is refundable and not pending for allotment, hence it is not a part of equity. Deferred tax liability has been correctly shown under non-current liabilities. But deferred tax assets and deferred tax liabilities, both, cannot be shown in balance sheet because only the net balance of deferred tax liability or asset is to be shown if the enterprise has a legally enforceable right to set off assets against liabilities representing current tax, and it relates to the same governing tax laws. Under the main heading of non-current assets, property, Plant and equipment are further classified as under Tangible assets Intangible assets Capital work in progress Intangible assets under development Keeping in view the above, the queep shall be shown under property, 
plant and equipment as capital work in progress. The amount of capital advances included in QIP shall be disclosed under the subheading Long-Term Loans and Advances under the heading Non-Current Assets. Subsequent to the notification of Ministry of Corporate Affairs dated 11th October 2018 under Section 467 1 of the Companies Act 2013, the words fixed assets shall be substituted with the words property, plant and equipment. Deferred tax asset shall be shown under non-current asset. It should be the net balance of deferred tax asset after adjusting the balance of deferred tax liability if the enterprise has a legally enforceable right to set off assets against liabilities representing current tax, and it relates to the same governing tax laws. Subsequent to the notification of Ministry of Corporate Affairs dated 11th October 2018 under Section 467 1 of the Companies Act 2013, trade payables should be disclosed as follows. Total outstanding dues of micro enterprises and small enterprises and total outstanding dues of creditors other than micro enterprises and small enterprises. 2.Z Limited changed its employee remuneration policy from 1st April 2018 to provide for 12% contribution to provident fund on leave encashment also. As per the leave encashment policy, the employees can either utilize or encash it. As at 31st March 2019, the company obtained an actuarial valuation for leave encashment liability. However, it did not provide for 12% PF contribution on it. The auditor of the company wants it to be provided but the management replied that as and when the employees availed leave encashment, the provident fund contribution was made. The company further contends that this is the correct treatment as it is not sure whether the employees will avail leave encashment or utilize it. Comment Answer as per para 11 of S15 on employee benefits issued by the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India, an enterprise should recognize the expected cost of short-term employee benefits in the form of compensated absences in the case of accumulating compensated absences when the employees render service that increases their entitlement to future compensated absences. Since the company obtained actuarial valuation for leave encashment, it is obvious that the compensated absences are accumulating in nature. An enterprise should measure the expected cost of accumulating compensated absences as additional amount that the enterprise expects to pay as a result of the unused entitlement that has accumulated at the balance sheet date. Here, Z Limited will accumulate the amount of leave encashment benefits as it is the liability of the company to provide 12% PF on amount of leave encashment. Hence the contention of the auditor is correct that full provision should be provided by the company. K Limited had five subsidiaries as at 31st March 2020 and the investments in subsidiaries are considered as long-term and valued at cost. 
Two of the subsidiaries had their net worth eroded as at 31st March 2019 and the prospects of their recovery are very bleak and the other three subsidiaries are doing exceptionally well. The company did not provide for the decline in the value of investments in two subsidiaries because the overall investment portfolio in subsidiaries did not suffer any decline as the other three subsidiaries are doing exceptionally well. Comment Answer As per as 13, accounting for investments, Issued by the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India, long-term investments are usually of individual importance to the investing enterprise. The carrying amount of long-term investments is therefore determined on an individual investment basis. Investments classified as long-term investments should be carried in the financial statements at cost. However, provision for diminution shall be made to recognize a decline, other than temporary, in the value of the investments, such reduction being determined and made for each investment individually keeping in view the above. K Limited should provide for the decline in the value of investments in two subsidiaries despite the fact that the overall investment portfolio in subsidiaries did not suffer any decline. 4. While adopting the accounts for the year, the Board of Directors of Sunrise Limited decided to consider the interim dividend declared at 15% as final dividend and did not consider transfer of profit to reserves. Answer Declaration of Interim Dividend Section 123 3, of the Companies Act 2013 provides that the board of directors of a company may declare interim dividend during any financial year out of the surplus in the statement of profit and loss and out of profits of the financial year in which such interim dividend is sought to be declared. The amount of dividend including interim dividend should be deposited in a separate bank account within five days from the declaration of such dividend for the compliance of Section 123.4 of the said Act. Based on Section 2.35 of the Act, it can be said that since interim dividend is also a dividend, Companies should provide for depreciation as required by Section 123 before declaration of interim dividend. However, the first proviso to Section 123.1 provides that a company may, before the declaration of any dividend in any financial year, transfer such percentage of its profit for that financial year as it may consider appropriate to the reserves of the company irrespective of the size of the declared dividend i.e. the company is not mandatorily required to transfer the profit to the reserves. It is an option available to the company to transfer such percentage. In the instant case, the board has decided to pay interim dividend at 15% of the paid-up capital. Assuming that the company has complied with the depreciation requirement, the interim dividend can be declared without transferring such percentage of its profits to the reserves of the company. 5. MG Private Limited Seeks your advice while preparing the financial statements i.e. the general instructions to be followed while preparing balance sheet under Companies Act 2013 in respect of current assets and liabilities.
Answer. General instructions for preparation of balance sheet. I. General instruction in respect of current assets. An asset shall be classified as current when it satisfies any of the following criteria. It is expected to be realized in, or is intended for sales or consumption in, the company's normal operating cycle. It is held primarily for the purpose of being traded. It is expected to be realized within 12 months after the reporting date, or it is cash or cash equivalent unless it is restricted from being exchanged or used to settle a liability for at least 12 months after the reporting date. 3. General instruction in respect of current liabilities. A liability shall be classified as current when it satisfies any of the following criteria. It is expected to be settled in the company's normal operating cycle. It is held primarily for the purpose of being traded. It is due to be settled within 12 months after the reporting date, or the company does not have an unconditional right to defer settlement of the liability for at least 12 months after the reporting date. Terms of a liability that could, at the option of the counterparty, result in its settlement by the issue of equity instruments do not affect its classification. 6. As an auditor, how would you deal with the following situations? Ram and Hanuman Associates, chartered accountants in practice, have been appointed as statutory auditor of Krishna Limited. For the accounting year 2018 to 2019, Mr. Hanuman, a partner of Ram and Hanuman Associates, holds 100 equity shares of Shiva Limited, a subsidiary company of Krishna Limited. Answer A. Auditor holding securities of a company, as per subsection, 3. D. I. Of section. 141 of the Companies Act. 2013 along with Rule 10 of the Companies, Audit and Auditors, Rule, 2014, a person shall not be eligible for appointment as an auditor of a company, who, or his relative or partner is holding any security of or interest in the company or its subsidiary or of its holding or associate company or a subsidiary of such holding company, provided that the relative may hold security or interest in the company of face value not exceeding rupees 1 lakh. Also, as per subsection 4 of section 141 of the Companies Act 2013, where a person appointed as an auditor of a company incurs any of the disqualifications mentioned in subsection 3. After his appointment, he shall vacate his office as such auditor and such vacation shall be deemed to be a casual vacancy in the office of the auditor. In the present case, Mr. Hanuman, Chartered Accountant, a partner of M.S. Ram and Hanuman Associates, holds 100 equity shares of Shiva Limited, which is a subsidiary of Krishna Limited. Therefore, the firm, M.S. Ram and Hanuman Associates would be disqualified to be appointed as statutory auditor of Krishna Limited, as per Section 141, 3. D. I., which is the holding company of Shiva Limited, 
because Mr. Hanuman, one of the partners, is holding equity shares of its subsidiary. Nick Limited is a subsidiary of Ajinta Limited, whose 20% shares have been held by central government, 25% by Uttar Pradesh government and 10% by Madhya Pradesh government. Nick Limited appointed Mr. Prem as its statutory auditor. Answer According to Section 1397 of the Companies Act 2013, the auditors of a government company shall be appointed or reappointed by the Controller and Auditor General of India, CNAG. As per Section 2, 45, a government company is defined as any company in which not less than 51% of the total voting power is held by the central government or by any state government or governments or partly by the central government and partly by one or more state governments and includes a company which is a subsidiary of a government company as thus defined. In the given case, Ajinta Limited is a government company as its 20% shares have been held by central government, 25% by UP state government and 10% by MP state government. Total 55% shares have been held by central and state governments, therefore, it is a government company. Nick Limited is a subsidiary company of Ajinta Limited. Hence, Nick Limited is covered in the definition of a government company. Therefore, auditor of Nick Limited can be appointed only by CNAG. Contravene Limited appointed CA Innocent as an auditor for the company for the current financial year. Further the company offered him the services of actuarial, investment advisory and investment banking which was also approved by the board of directors. Answer Services not to be rendered by the auditor Section 144 of the Companies Act, 2013 prescribes certain services not to be rendered by the auditor. An auditor appointed under the Act shall provide to the company only such other services as are approved by the Board of Directors or the Audit Committee, as the case may be but which shall not include any of the following services, whether such services are rendered directly or indirectly to the company or its holding company or subsidiary company. Namely, Accounting and Bookkeeping Services Internal Audit Design and Implementation of Any Financial Information System Actuarial Services Investment Advisory Services Investment Banking Services Rendering of Outsourced Financial Services Management Services and Any other kind of services as may be prescribed. Further Section 1413 I of the Companies Act 2013 also disqualifies a person for appointment as an auditor of a company who is engaged as on the date of appointment in consulting and specialized services as provided in section 144. In the given case, CA Innocent was appointed as an auditor of Contravene Limited. He was offered additional services of actuarial, investment advisory and investment banking which was also approved by the board of directors.
The auditor is advised not to accept the services as these services are specifically notified in the services not to be rendered by him as an auditor as per section 144 of the Act. Mr. Amma, a chartered accountant, bought a car financed at 7 lakhs by Choudhury Finance Limited which is a holding company of Charan Limited, and Das Limited. He has been the statutory auditor of Das Limited, and continues to be even after taking the loan. Answer D. According to Section 141, 3, D. 2, of the Companies Act, 2013, a person is not eligible for appointment as auditor of any company if he is indebted to the company or its subsidiary or its holding or associate company or a subsidiary of such holding company in excess of rupees 5 lakh. In the given case, Mr. Amar is disqualified to act as an auditor under Section 141.3.d.2 as he is indebted to Choudhury Finance Limited for more than 5 lakhs. Also, according to Section 141.3.d.2, he cannot act as an auditor of any subsidiary of Choudhury Finance Limited, i.e. he is also disqualified to work in Charan Limited and Das Limited. Therefore, he has to vacate his office in Das Limited, even though it is a subsidiary of Choudhury Finance Limited. Hence audit work performed by Mr. Amar as an auditor is invalid. He should vacate his office immediately and thus limited. Should appoint another auditor for the company. 7. Astha Private Limited Has fully paid capital of 140 lakhs. During the year. The company had borrowed 15 lakhs each from a bank and a financial institution. It had the turnover, net of GST 50 lakhs which is credited to a separate account, of 475 lakhs. Will Companies, Auditors Report, Order, 2016 be applicable to Astha Private Limited. Answer Applicability of CARO 2016 The CARO 2016 specifically exempts a private limited company, not being a subsidiary or holding company of a public company having a paid up capital and reserves and surplus not more than rupees 1 crore as on the balance sheet date and which does not have total borrowings exceeding rupees 1 crore from any bank or financial institution at any point of time during the financial year and which does not have a total revenue as disclosed in Schedule 3 to the Companies Act 2013, including revenue from discontinuing operations, exceeding rupees 10 crore during the financial year as per the financial statements. In the case of Astha Private Limited, it has outstanding loan of 30 lakhs, 15 lakhs plus 15 lakhs collectively from bank and financial institution which is less than 1 crore rupees and turnover is 475 lakhs i.e. also less than 10 crores and not exceeding the limit. However it has paid capital of 140 lakhs i.e. more than 1 crore. Thus, Considering its paid-up capital which is exceeding the prescribed limit for exemption, 
Karo 2016 will be applicable to Astha Private Limited 8. Dot under Karo 2020 As a statutory auditor, how would you report on the following? A term loan was obtained from a bank for 80 lakhs for acquiring R&D equipment, out of which 15 lakh was used to buy a car for use of the R&D director. Answer. Utilization of term loans, according to Clause 9 of Para 3 of CARO 2020. The auditor is required to report whether term loans were applied for the purposes for which those were obtained. If not, the amount of loan so diverted and the purpose for which it is used may be reported. The auditor should examine the terms and conditions of the term loan with the actual utilization of the loans. If the auditor finds that the fund has not been utilized for the purpose for which they were obtained, the report should state the fact. In the instant case, term loan taken for the purpose of R&D equipment has been utilized for the purchase of car which has no relation with R&D equipment. Therefore, car though used for R&D director cannot be considered as R&D equipment. The auditor should state the fact in his report as per paragraph 3 clause 9 of the CARO 2020 that out of the term loan taken for R&D equipment, 15 lakhs was not utilized for the intended purpose of acquiring R&D equipment. Physical verification of only 40% of items of inventory has been conducted by the company. The balance 60% will be conducted in next year due to lack of time and resources. Answer Physical verification of inventory Clause 2 of Para 3 of CARO 2020 requires the auditor to report on whether physical verification of inventory has been conducted at reasonable intervals by the management. Physical verification of inventory is the responsibility of the management which should normally verify all material items at least once in a year and more often in appropriate cases. The auditor in order to satisfy himself about verification at reasonable intervals should examine the adequacy of evidence and record of verification. In the given case, the above requirement of CARO 2020 has not been fulfilled as such and the auditor should point out the specific areas where he believes the procedure of inventory verification is not reasonable. He may consider the impact on financial statement and report accordingly. 9.T Private Limited's paid up capital and reserves are less than 50 lakhs and it has no outstanding loan exceeding 25 lakhs from any bank or financial institution. Its sales are 6 crores before deducting trade discount 10 lakhs and sales returns 95 lakhs. The services rendered by the company amounted to 10 lakhs. The company contends that reporting under company's auditor's reports order, CARO, is not applicable. Discuss. Applicability of CARO 2016 The CARO 2016 specifically exempts a private limited company not being a subsidiary or holding company of a public company, 
having a paid up capital and reserves and surplus not more than rupees 1 crore as on the balance sheet date and which does not have total borrowings exceeding rupees 1 crore from any bank or financial institution at any point of time during the financial year and which does not have a total revenue as disclosed in Schedule 3 to the Companies Act 2013, including revenue from discontinuing operations, exceeding Rs 10 crore during the financial year as per the financial statements. In the given case, paid up capital and reserves of T private limited are less than 1 crore and has no loan outstanding exceeding 1 crore from any bank or financial institution. Further, its total revenue as disclosed in Schedule 3 to the Companies Act 2013, including revenue from discontinuing operations, is not exceeding rupees 10 crore during the financial year as per the financial statements. Thus, CARO will not be applicable to T Private Limited. 10 The financial statements of MP Limited. As on 31st March 2020 are to be prepared under Division Ill of Schedule 3 to the Companies Act 2013. Comment on the disclosure compliances for MP Limited. From the following information in the financial statements which are required to be drawn up in compliance with Indian Accounting Standard. I. Property, plant and equipment include 2.50 crore for a boiler plant under construction. Cash and cash equivalents include 1.25 crore deposited with a nationalized bank on 31st March 2020 for 18 months. It is shown under current assets. Non-current assets include under caption, biological assets other than bearer plants, a sum of 1.50 crore being cost of cultivation for bringing to yield level, the cashewnut trees whose yield period, according to estimate shall not be less than 10 years. Answer. Disclosure of boiler plant under construction. Boiler plant under construction should be shown under the heading Capital work in progress instead of property plan and equipment. Thus, inclusion of value of boiler plant under construction in property plan and equipment is not in order. Disclosure of cash and cash equivalents deposited with nationalized bank Bank deposits with more than 12 months maturity shall be disclosed under other financial assets. Therefore, disclosure of deposits rupees 1.25 crores in a nationalized bank for 18 months as cash and cash equivalents is not in order as per Division 2 of Schedule 3. Disclosure of cost of cultivation for bringing to yield level the cashewnut trees. Cost of 1.5 crore rupees for cultivation for bringing to yield level. The cashewnut trees whose yield period is more than one period will form part of bearer plant. Hence it will not be considered as biological assets other than bearer plant. Therefore, it should be shown under the heading Property Plant and Equipment as bearer plant as per Division 2 of Schedule 3. 14. What are the reporting requirements in the audit report under the Companies Act 2013 CARO 2020 for the following situations? 
A fraud has been committed against the company by a vendor of the company. The company has committed a major fraud on its customer and the case is pending in the court. Answer Reporting requirements in the audit report under the Companies Act 2013 Caro 2020, according to Clause 11 A of Para 3 of Caro 2020. The auditor is required to report whether any fraud by the company or any fraud on the company has been noticed or reported during the year. If yes, the nature and the amount involved is to be indicated. Further, as per Clause 11 B of Para 3 of Caro 2020, whether any report under subsection 12 of Section 143 of the Companies Act has been filed by the auditors in Form ADT 4 as prescribed under Rule 13 of Companies, Audit and Auditors, Rules 2014 with the Central Government. As per Section 143, 12 S of the Companies Act, 2013, if an auditor of a company, in the course of the performance of his duties as auditor, has reason to believe that an offense involving fraud is being or has been committed against the company by officers or employees of the company, he shall immediately report the matter to the central government. In case amount of fraud is rupees 1 crore or above, or audit committee or board in other cases, in case the amount of fraud involved is less than rupees 1 crore, within such time and in such manner as may be prescribed. A fraud has been committed against the company by a vendor of the company. In case employees or management are involved in fraud committed by vendor, reporting has to be done in accordance with CARO 2020 and as per Section 143, 12 of the Companies Act, 2013. Suspected fraud by vendors Customers and other third parties should be dealt with in accordance with SA 240. Therefore, reporting has to be done in accordance with SA 240. The auditor's responsibilities relating to fraud in an audit of financial statements. The company has committed a major fraud on its customer and the case is pending in the court. Company has committed major fraud on its customer of which case is pending in the court. Major fraud committed by the company on its customer has to be reported in accordance with Clause 11 of Para 3 of Caro 2020. MCQ. One reopening of accounts on courts or tribunals orders. Section 130 of the Companies Act. 2013 states that a company shall not reopen its books of account and not recast its financial statements unless an application in this regard is made by the central government. The Income Tax Authorities, the Securities and Exchange Board of India, SABI, any other statutory regulatory body or authority or any person concerned and an order is made by a court of competent jurisdiction or the tribunal. To the effect that Jane Limited has an annual turnover of 350 crores and has been into losses for the last two years. The operations of the company are good. Due to some technology changes, 
the company started facing competition and hence started incurring losses. The company plans to revive in the next one to two years with the improvements in its processes. During the year ended 31st March 2019, the management of the company came across certain transactions relating to the financial year ended 31st March 2018 which were erroneously missed to be accounted for. This would result into losses and hence the management is considering to take this to the right financial year and for that purpose to reopen its accounts for the financial year ended 31st March 2018. Please advise. The position of the management is correct. The action of the management is correct. However, the reason behind reopening the accounts of last year does not seem to be correct. The action of the management would have been correct had it been advised by the auditors of the company and for the same management should have taken approval from SABI. The action of the management is not correct. Answer. Option. D. The action of the management is not correct. 2. Remy Limited was set up initially as a private limited company. Subsequently, it got converted into a public company. The company's management has plans of expansion but the business was not growing in an organic manner. Therefore, the management decided to acquire the competitors. During the financial year ended 31st March 2019, the company acquired two companies in India and France in September 2018 and January 2019 respectively. The company controls both of these companies as per the criteria laid down in the Companies Act 2013 as well as the applicable accounting standards. The management started discussions with the auditors regarding the audit wherein it was also pointed out by the auditors that the management should also prepare consolidated financial statements, CFS, if they want. Management needs your advice on the same. Management must prepare the CFS as per the requirements of the Companies Act, 2013. Management has a choice not to prepare CFS but should go for that considering that its true performance and financial position can then be demonstrated. Management could have prepared CFS if the acquired companies would have completed at least one year post-acquisition. Management must prepare CFS but it should include only the company acquired in India. Answer. Option. A. Management must prepare the CFS as per the requirements of the Companies Act. 2013. K Private Limited has been providing marketing support services to its parent company based out of Ireland. The company's operations are not large and have remained stable over the last few years. Recently the parent company was acquired by another company and the new investor wanted to reassess whether the company in India should continue or should be shut down considering the legal compliances. It was advised to the new investor that the company should be converted into LLP. In December 2018, 
the new management decided that they would get the company converted into LLP and also discussed that matter with their statutory auditors. The management is expecting that the LLP conversion would get completed by February 2019 and wants that the auditors should audit the financial statements of the LLP at the year end because conversion is only an administrative process and hence it would not impact their work. The management would need to get the financial statements audited from new auditor appointed by CAD in case of LLP. The management would need to appoint new auditor and the new auditor can audit LLP at year end in one go both for the period it was a company and then when it became LLP. The auditor of the company should audit the company before its conversion and then the new auditor for LLP would audit LLP separately. The auditor of the company should audit the company before its conversion and then the new auditor for LLP would audit LLP separately. But this is a choice available to the auditor. Answer Option C. The auditor of the company should audit the company before its conversion and then the new auditor for LLP would audit LLP separately. AJ Private Limited was incorporated on 21st March 2018 and has limited operations. However, the capital induction in the company was huge because it would be capital intensive. The company is in the process to set up a plant in Karnataka which should be completed by 31st May 2019. The company's management prepared its financial statements for the year ended 31st March 2019. The auditors were also called to start the work in April 2019. The auditors would be able to complete their work by 31st May 2019 and accordingly would issue their audit report by first week of June 2019 as per the plan agreed with the management. The auditors have some observations related to preparations of financial statements which are not in compliance with Schedule 3 and most importantly the point related to capitalization of the plant as property, plant and equipment in the financial statements for the year ended 31st March 2019. Please suggest which of the following statements would be correct. The compliance of Schedule 3 shall start from 1st April 2019 for this company as per company's accounts. Amendment Rules 2016 the compliance of Schedule 3 shall start from 1st financial period. However, some exemptions would be applicable as per company's accounts rules 2014. There should be full compliance of Schedule 3 and plant should be kept as quip as per Schedule 3. There should be full compliance of Schedule 3 and plant should be shown as PPE as per Schedule 3. Answer Option C there should be full compliance of Schedule 3 and plant should be kept as quip as per Schedule 3. SHRD Private Limited is engaged in the business of software and consultancy. The company has an annual turnover of 2000 crores but its profit margins are not very good as compared to the industry standards. For the financial year ended 31st March 2019, 
The company proposed appointment of its statutory auditors at its general meeting. However, the remuneration was not finalized. The statutory auditors completed the engagement formalities including the engagement letter between the company and the auditors and it was decided that the engagement letter be signed without fee i.e. with the clause that the fee to be mutually decided. Please provide your views on this. Such engagement letter is not valid. Engagement letter with such arrangement is valid. Engagement letter should specify the fee of last year. If applicable, if the fee for the current year is not yet finalized at the time of signing of the engagement letter. Engagement letter should specify 10% increase in the fee as compared to last year as per the norms of the ICAI. In case the fee is not finalized at the time of signing of the engagement letter. Answer. Option. B. Engagement letter with such arrangement is valid. Chapter 6. Audit Reports. Multiple choice questions. 1. MTP March 2019 Question number 1. 2 marks. One of your team members has recently qualified as a chartered accountant and joined your team to audit a portfolio of audit clients who are private companies. One of the clients Surrey Private. Limited is a hotel in the small town near Jalpur. The revenue generated for the current year ended is hours 10.5 crores and the entity is not a holding or subsidiary of any public company. The owner of the business Mr. Hazelwood runs this family business from last 10 years. Your team member is keen to know whether Surrey Private Limited is required to comment on the matter prescribed under CARO 2020. Which of your explanations to him are correct?